Man, they got the books and the records of the top 500 companies. They got a defense department budget down here. And they got a negative for all your favorite movies. They got microfilm with tax return and newspaper stories. They got immigration records and census reports. And they got official accounts of all the wars and plane crashes and volcano eruptions and earthquakes and fires and floods and all the other disasters that interrupted the flow of things in the good old U.S. of A. Now, what does it matter, Sarah, darling? All this filing and record keeping. We ever gonna give a shit? We even gonna get a chance to see it all? This is a great big 14 mile tombstone! With an epitaph on it that nobody gonna bother to read. Now here you come, here you come, with a whole new set of charts and graphs and records. What you gonna do? Bury them down here with all the other relics of what once was? I'ma tell you what is. Yeah, I'ma tell you what is. You ain't never gonna figure it out. Just like they never figured out why the stars are where they're at. It ain't mankind's job to figure that stuff out. So what you're doing is a waste of time, Sarah. And time is all we got left, you know. I'm doing. It's all there's left to do. Shame on you. There's plenty to do. Plenty to do. So as long as there's you and me and maybe some other people, we could start over. Start fresh. Get some babies and teach them, Sarah. Teach them never to come over here and dig these records out. Hey. You want to put some kind of explanation down here before you leave? Here's one as good as any like the fact. We've been punished by the Creator. He visited a curse on us. So we might get a look at who. What hell was like. And welcome to Ice Creams. It's the spooky season. It's October, and there's no way that we can get into the Halloween season without, you know, acknowledging the movies of George Romero. Now, for this horror fan, you know, there's three movies in that. Well, there's more than three, but there's an initial trilogy, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and for, my, for what it's worth for me, I think the greatest movie in the series is Day of the Dead. I am very happy and excited to have with me today, Flyboy himself, Mr. Terry Alexander. Terry, welcome to Ice Creams. Hey, thank you. It's good to be here, buddy. It's, it's always amazing good. to see you. You're yes. looking fantastic, I gotta say. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, the years have piled up, but I try and stay in shape. You're doing a good job of it. You're doing a good job of it. Um, you know, so talking about years, you know, You've had and continue to have, you know, a prolific acting career that spanned five decades. Um, so, you know, at what point did you, you know, kind of say to yourself, I'm going to be an actor when you were younger? Uh, I was like in the ninth grade, I must have been 14, and I fell in love with a play called Cyrano de Bergerac. It's a beautiful poetic play and a great character. And I kind of related to it. And here's this guy who's a philosopher, a swordsman, musician. He's a cool guy and he's a writer, but he's not accepted by society for some reason. And it's his nose. <laughs> so, so I kind of related to that and fell in love with that story. And that started my trail out to the theater. Beautiful, beautiful. So, so theater was a big part of your sort of early years there? Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. I studied at the university in Detroit. 
uh, theater there and gravitated from there to, of course, New York, uh, the mecca of theater in America, but not really because there's theater all over this country and all the great cities uh, around America. But that's where I went and went to New York and uh, studied a bit, got into a play, um, early African-American play called No Place to Be Somebody. And that was the first African-American play to win a Pulitzer. And the writer of this, oh man, he was such a great coach and he took me under his arm and he led me through the character I was playing because it was the lead character and I was kind of young but he led me through it. Me and Philip Michael Thomas uh, did it on Broadway together. Uh, so I went that far. I was in, in and around that play for like two and a half years. And from there, I you know, auditioned for other things in the theater and got some things here and there. Some really, really nice thing. But the theater was my heart. That's all I can tell you. Really, eh? And, and you yeah. see now, you, you know, you got and done it now. You, you've got and address one of my other passions which is Miami Vice. Uh, you're telling me you're, ah, you're yes, like yes. Thomas there. Uh, yeah. that, that's absolutely amazing. Um, so, you know, obviously, so a lot of theater and, you know, I, I noticed that your trajectory, as with a lot of actors starting out, there's a lot of television in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I actually noticed one of your credits there was on uh, an episode of Salvage One with Andy Griffith, which is... Oh. A, <laughs> Long ago, my friend. <laughs> I love, you know, that's one of my, I love that show. I really did love that. You did. But I, yeah, I really did. But I got to ask you, you know, what's your kind of most vivid snapshot of being a young actor in the 70s? Well, back in the 70s, there were only four channels. So your odds of getting on TV were long in the first place. So at that point in time, it was the 70s, just 60s had just come and the cultural revolution was still perky in the 70s and people were looking to express themselves in different ways. So for me, it was a great time in the 70s, really a, a sweet time. It backed up a little bit in the 80s with you know drug infestation and all that kind of stuff like that. But the 70s were cool and I felt I could get someplace. I felt with that experience behind me that, that I got in the theater stuff I was doing, I could do it. I could get some good TV work. And I got some TV spots, of course, here and there. I did a soap opera for a number of years, uh, that kind of work. Um, but I just felt alive somehow. I felt a challenge in the 70s. It was a really cool time, really cool. Really, really. And, and and what was it like sort of transitioning from theater into TV? How did you find the difference there? Uh, it's bringing it in more there. You, you can't, you have to project out 50 roles sometimes when you're doing your character and that takes great voice and great breath. Now for camera, you got to back way up and go way inside and, and prepare your inner life as strongly as you do on stage, but it just has to be quieter in the mm -hmm. electrical sense. That's the difference. And they're, they're, I mean, there are great movie actors. I mean, dynamite movie and TV actors, but they can't get on stage. <laughs> it's hard for them. It's hard when you start there, you know, it's hard to go back to the stage. You come from the stage to film if you can. Gotcha. Yeah. Huh. So you said, that um, you know, you started doing this, and, and you you felt really alive, which is you know, I mean, that's I'm all about positivity. That's what I always you know, that's that's my, my big thing. Um, so I guess what was that first moment in your career, that first big high where you felt like, yes, this is what I wanted. I'm do I'm on the right path here. Um, Lincoln Center, uh, and a uh play called Streamers, written by David Rabe, directed by Mike Nichols. It was an anti-war piece. And anti-war was big in the 60s because the draft was still on. So we did that play. And actually, it was a horror play because they joked about the war for 
first act. They joked about the issues of homosexuality these two guys were having in the barracks. And at the end, this other brother comes in and he starts stabbing people. So the war came right to you at the end of the play. And I tell you, people fainted in the audience from seeing the blood and the gore that Mike Nichols painted on that stage. It was fantastic. And the play had to go on. Is there a doctor in the house? My, my husband's fainted, they would say. Wow. <laughs> yeah, man, it was heavy. It was just so heavy. And I did that play for a year. I was with just several brilliant actors. And to be with several brilliant actors on stage is wow. This is the greatest feeling because every night they come in just on it every night brilliantly and they're bringing you something of their special talent and i stayed that long because they were that good in that play and it said something to the audience people fainting because of blood is what it's about in horror movies too right yeah yeah amazing amazing and and, and it's funny that you say that because there's a perfect transition there and that is that you know, they're, they're, you're dealing with real horror there with the war, with war and, and such. You as, a, as an actor, you know, I don't want to paint you as a horror guy because you've had such a prolific, you've done so many different things, but you are beloved to the horror audience. Are you a horror guy? Like, were you, did you, did, were you into horror films as, as, when you were younger and such? Of course, a lot of sci-fi horror. Yeah, that's my favorite genre, sci-fi horror, because the monsters, the people they create to come in, whether they eat you or not, they're foreign and they're different. That was my favorite kind. I mean, the ghoul thing with the mask and killing people indiscriminately from one end of the movie to the next is not my favorite horror genre. Mm -hmm. But uh, sci-fi, vampires, uh, things like that, you know, di different. Uh, I just saw something called *Malignant*, which is a, is a very into you know innovative horror movie. Uh, so that's how I feel about. It. I mean, I I'll do horror. I mean, I'll do straight. Uh, I, I love being an icon in, in the horror community. I mean, I got lucky enough to get that role in the first place. So uh, I gave it my best. And you never know what's going to be on the cutting floor. You never know what's going to make it on film. So I kind of got excited after I saw it. You know, uh, you don't want to get too excited too quickly. But it was uh, an excellent movie. Uh, there were excellent actors in it. Uh, special effects were, what can I say, they're still today uh, top notch. Uh, Savini did a, a masterful job at, uh, on that movie. Actually, he wanted to play Sergeant Rose. But George said, no, 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 you got to do one or the other, you know. So that's how that worked out. And he was stunning. It was just stunning. So you know what? Because we got a lot to talk about about Day of the Dead. We really do. Because as I said right at the beginning, and I'm not going to make any secret of this, it's my favorite of all of them. It really is. So let's back up a second here. Let's go take a couple of steps back. And you're, you know, you're coming into the 80s, you know, you're, you're on a collision course with that role of John that is just going to make you an icon in the horror community forever. How did you first come into, how did you, how did the, how did the Day of the Dead journey, Day of the Dead journey begin for you? Well, it's been a very slow journey. I think people now, right now, are beginning to catch up with what George was saying in that film, because when it came out, nobody paid attention. Uh, Return of the Living Dead came out just before us, and that's where all the attention went, that's where all the press went. So it, it didn't develop for a long time, the kind of appreciation for that film. So we waited and we waited, and now it's coming to fruition. I feel it now, they feel it now. I don't know why, and it still's got it still has classic e e events in it, and and mm. still, so it stood the test of time, is which I I most I, I love that that it's stood the test of time. Oh, big time! Uh, yes, because some movies can get dated, 
you know, and, and you say, oh, that's that time period, and it doesn't go on and on and on. But Day of the Dead does that. I love it. Amazing. And how did, so were you familiar with George Romero before coming to Day of the Dead? Yeah, of course, I'd seen Night of the Living Dead. Okay. Uh, 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 yes, I had seen some other, of course, many of the horror films, but that's I, my familiarity with George was Night of the Living Dead. So I just heard he was coming into town looking for someone who could do a West Indian accent with this character. And I said, I can do that. I can do that <laughs> well. So I got an audition and I saw the material, man. I said, damn, this is, this is great stuff. George, hey man, I just read this. You gotta let me, give me a day, man, just to look at this beautiful speech. Just give me a day. He said, okay, take a day. I said, oh, thank you. So I went home, I worked on it, I slept with it, came back, did it for him, and that was it, just like that. And I okay. felt very lucky and that he did give me a day to work on. We're, we're talking about your speech scene here, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. That's yeah. The one. Let's pause that for a second because, yeah. wow, do I want to talk about that? Because okay. honestly, it's, it's one of the top moments in it's one of the every time after watching the movie I, i've lost track how many times i've seen the film <laughs> and every time i break out in goosebumps um i have a fellow uh co-host that i work with who has his own channel a gentleman by the name of carl kaifer we're always discussing and debating your speech scene in there between with uh, with laurie and, and jarla um uh -huh. but what i want to ask you first is when you so you're you're looking at this script for the first time and John is an incredibly complex character. He's a awesome, like, you know, you don't know what to make of him at first, you know, like comes off a little bit of a kind of, he's a little bit of a jerk at first. And then there's this progression where you're like, oh yeah, I kind of see where this guy's at. And before becoming full fledged, okay, this guy's a hero through and through. What were your feelings when you first were reading the role of, when you're reading the script by yourself, what were your initial impressions of the character? I, uh, I thought it was uh, a great role, first of all. This is a great role, okay. Now, how am I gonna deal with this, with an accent, doing a character that all the other characters around are pretty heavyweight bad guys, you know? I mean, they're pretty heavyweight. So I, I try to lean it out and stay as quiet, as quiet intensity, it maybe is the thing I was playing in that. And uh, I think that built up for the character. And George was very careful with those characters too. He really was the first time he didn't want people to make up stuff. He said, I want you to stick to the lines and do them just like I wrote them. And I thought, this is why I'm back in the theater again. I uh, know that this is what he said. So he was very specific in guiding the characters around the movie because I started out doing the last scene first. And you know how you do film, you never know where you're going to be. Yeah. But yeah. George was, uh, was, it was powerful in, in leading me and the other actors in their development of character. Um, I, I I loved it. I loved working with him, and I loved, loved working with his writer head and his his acting head because he's done that too. Uh, it, it was really a fine experience. So I I can't take full credit. I have to give kudos to George. And and you know and and and, and of course you know he the man's a, a legend. You know, rest his soul. You know, he's he's a legend. Will be a legend long after you and I are gone. Um, but one of the great things about Day of the Dead is, you know, outside of Romero's vision is the amazing cast outside of yourself, Terry. You know, we got, you know, Laurie Cardelli, Joe Pilato, um, Richard Liberty. It's one of those casts where there's no weak link. Yes. Everybody bring, brought their A game. What's yes. your fondest memory from the set of working as, as a sort of a collaborative with those actors? My favorite line is there, is there something to eat? <laughs> That's Richard Liberty. 
He says, all that ugliness, Joe just goes off and running like crazy. And just, just, just insult, and she says, well, give me something to eat. It was, he was wonderful. I have to say, Richard was awesome. He gave a brilliant performance. And just watching the guys sometimes, like, you're not working, you're off camera. Watching them work and saying, wow, this is going to be something. These guys are on fire. That's part of enjoying the experience of making a movie, man. Whew, you're right. It was just stunning to watch those guys. I, I, um, I had a conversation about a year ago with uh, John Amplis. And John had said to me that Joe Pilato was just a force to be reckoned with on the set in terms of keeping everybody's energy up and, and you know, what was your impressions working with Joe? Uh, again, George, um, George brought his... Sorry, craft. Joe, Joe Pilato. I know, but George Romero... Oh, sorry, I apologize. ...directing craft in many different ways. And Joe starts way up high. <laughs> you know, like, and George would say, that's where I want you to be at the end. So I'm going to push you down. And he pushed him down. And that's the way he worked with him. And other actors, you've got to bring him out of you got to say, oh, uh, this is not working. Uh, it's hitting you hard. And bring it out just a little. You didn't have to do that with Joe. He was way <laughs> up there all the time, man. So that's the way George worked with him. He pushed him down. And it, it was it was incredible how where he pushed him. It, it was brilliant to watch those guys uh, do that. Incredible. Uh, yeah. yeah. So now we're going to talk about that speech. We got to right. talk about your speech. Um, okay. You know, it's again, I'll repeat, it's one of the finest moments in horror as far as I'm concerned. Um, no perfect. You talk about how George was saying, you know, read it as I wrote it. Walk me through that speech there, uh, Terry. Did, 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 what, did, was that some of that ad-libbed was it all from the script or it was what I auditioned with of course uh, and we rehearsed it once in Pittsburgh before we shot and we made some cuts to it then because George was saying eh, well, that's a little much and yeah we'll cut we'll cut so we cut some in the first beginning of the rehearsal process so when we came back it was the first and last thing we did together. That was the last scene we shot together on the movie because we had gone to Florida from the cave, gone to Florida and come back. And we were back in, in, in the cave again. And it was the last thing we shot together. And George just let me fly. You know, I had all that time to work on it. And the words were so poetic and lyric. He let me fly. And he would say, yes, that was good. And oh, I'm gonna come in close and he's gonna, I'm gonna do this part and that. But it took two, three takes to do that. And uh, it was great. I mean, I had all that time. Usually you don't get all that time <laughs> to, to work on a speech and you think it's gonna go on the editing floor anyway. And they wanna see somebody's head getting chopped off instead. But you're right, it stayed and it made a big difference, I think, to the movie. Uh, and to fans uh, who enjoy the movie, it really is special. Yeah, really special. And you know, it's and 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 your, you know, your conviction as you're delivering it is just you know like it's it's because it's a wonderful you know I I, I said at the er, earlier you know that I feel that at the beginning I'm I was, when I watched Day of the Dead for the first time I was a little on the fence about John. It's like what what is this guy all about here? But that's that wonderful revelatory moment where you really get inside the guy's head. And, and it's like, I understand this, man. I, yeah, you know, why are they down there? What are they doing? Yeah. Go soak up some sun. I'd be doing the same thing, right? You know? Yeah. yeah. But, and also to do it in a Jamaican accent, it's like singing it, you know? It's like singing. And that's what made it even more palatable. Uh, to people when you, you preach it, but you sing it to them. Uh, it worked quite well, I thought, quite well. Yeah, yeah. And all George's, yeah, George's touches, you know, came through there. And uh, uh, I'm surprised it made it though, truly. I'm surprised it made it, but I'm glad it did. 
I'm glad to. I think a lot. I think honestly, horror fans the world over are glad that that, that it, it it made it. Oh, super. so so you know, super. you complete the film. Everybody, you know, goes their separate ways, and you know, obviously, we know there's post production and stuff. Mm -hmm. Then you obviously get to sort of premiere night, and you're sitting in the audience for the first time and seeing your work and everybody's work on screen. What was that like? Wow, wow, that was uh, uh, a surprise to me. When George directed me at one point, we were sitting in, in, all together, and, and Rhodes is going off, you know, and he says, uh, at the end, when Rhodes, uh, you know, finishes, I just want you to smile. Just look at him and just smile. And I said, okay. And I looked at him, did one take, and he said, well, that was kind of evil smile. Don't, be, don't give me an evil smile. He said, just, just smile. And I looked up and I smiled. And that got a huge reaction from the audience. They cracked up. <laughs> they did. They cracked up. That was one of my most memorable moments because George put it in there. He was watching his character, see. And he said, I'm going to end it on you with that. That was not scripted, see. He was just watching the characters. That's how wonderful it was to work with him. Amazing, amazing. So, so I, moving on. Go, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's yeah, yeah. okay. No problem. Yeah. Moving yeah. on from from day to day, I gotta ask you. You know, because I know that you. You know, it, it's obviously it's it's an iconic work. You you're gonna get questions about that all the time. But you're in an interview. What is Tell me about one of your roles that you're so proud of. And you're like, I really wish an interviewer for a change would ask me about that. Hmm. Uh, well, we've discussed a lot of different things I've done. So I can say you've asked me about theater history. So we discussed some characters here and there. But... Uh, I, I can't say, I, I, I thought my time on a soap opera was fun because I learned a lot of craft there and, and how to improv if I had to there. And it was like a live performance on, on a soap opera. Uh, but nobody asks about that. You know, soap operas are gone mostly today to game shows and judge shows and things like that. But I learned a lot from doing a soap opera and then One Life to Live, uh, Paul Rausch, who had hired me many, many years ago on Another World, it came back to hire me again. So it was a reconnection too. So it was one of my uh, favorite. I'll thank you. If I win an award, Paul, I'm going to thank you. <laughs> no, it was uh, one of those reconnection things that happens once in a while uh, in show business. Uh, and that's happening right now. In fact, uh, as uh, I was working with a young lad named Marcus Slabine, and he wrote something called The Last Call. And he called me about four or five years ago and said, hey, man, I got something for you. And I said, really? OK, so we did. It's a horror film. It's about is, a this just... way, is this the one where you're a talk radio host, right? Yes, well, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yes. walk me, walk me, talk to us about that one, Terry. I'm really interested about that film. Yeah, he one of those prankster back in the day. These were pranksters on the radio. So uh, he did a prank, and uh, many many years ago, and it turned out pretty bad. So this is his last show on the air, uh, and all somehow the prankster gets karma. Karma comes around in that circle, and the son of the woman who actually kills herself comes back to haunt the entire studio. So. Uh, Again, it, it's uh, one of those mystery circular horror movies. And uh, he was a young, talented man. And I just had to do this for him. It was, it, did this out of love. It wasn't money or it wasn't anything like that. And it, we, he got a lot of awards uh, from a lot of the festivals. And now he's on his way. So since he had me there, he said, well, let's get Laurie, let's get Jarl, let's get them two together. Maybe we can do something together, a further statement of day. But day has been remade you know, several times. And, yeah, yeah. You know, so other people own the rights to all these characters or whatever. 
So he said, well, let's call it Night of the Living Dead 2. So he got Christine Romero and some other wonderful producer types, and he wrote a good script. So uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed if, if that happens ultimately, but uh, maybe the legend will continue. Uh, uh, it's called Night of the Living Dead 2. There's a website. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah, and actually I was going to ask you about that because, you know, it's it's kind of cheeky because I seen the picture of you and Rory and Jer and you, you know, and, and they're saying that you're on an island together. So obviously all us horror fans are, you know, we're putting the pieces together. They, they, is it, is it, is it, you know, is it they back together again? Is this in, inventing, you know, showing what happened next? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. I'm so yes. excited. So how, the world, excited. how the world 30 years from that place has changed on an island. And uh, it's a remarkable story. It really is quite good. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. You never know. Show business is a strange beast. You never know. It, it, it is, you know, it, it is a strange place. And you obviously, you're very, you know, you often attend the um, the Monroeville Convention. You know, you're, you're very active in, 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 the, in the horror community there. Do you ever get fans come up to you at the table and it's not Day of the Dead they're talking about for a second? Like, are they always Day of the Dead fans? Or do you ever get that curveball where it's like, hey, I loved you from Last Call or... Oh, you know, yeah, I was in Germany once and uh, a guy walks up to me and wants me to sign a DVD of The Werewolf of Washington. Right. That was my first little tiny piece in a horror movie. So sometimes they come in and with DVDs or, and they did something called The Horror Show not, um, when I got my arms chopped off in that. Uh, sometimes they want to... Uh, there's a poster of that. So yeah, fans come in, you know, from time to time with little things, yeah. But it's mostly day, you know, it's mostly day. Mostly day, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Have you ever been up to, have you done a convention? Because obviously I'm based up in Canada. Have you been up this way at any of your conventions? No, no, I haven't been up in Canada yet. Uh, you know, I would love to. I mean, I, I grew up in Detroit, so Canada was like, right across the river. So I spent a lot of time in Toronto growing up, uh, going to college at Dwight State and visiting that trek. In fact, they did a theater piece up there in Toronto called The Choice up there. Uh, this is from the 60s, this is way back when. But yes, love Canada, no Canada, driven all the way across Canada from east to west. Uh, so I wish I could get back there. So maybe you can put in a good word for me. You know what? I was literally just going to do the used salesman, uh, the car salesman. <laughs> what do I have to do to put you in a convention up here in Canada? Uh, I, you know, we'd love to have you up here. So you know what? Maybe, maybe I, I'm thinking I might actually take that on as a as a as a project for me to see what we can do to get you up here because you got so many fans up here in, in Canada, Terry. You got fans in everywhere, right? So you know. You know, here's a bit of a curveball kind of question for you, though. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't have gone into acting, what do you think you might have done? Did you, did you, was there ever a point where you were kind of debating another career choice there? Every time you're not working, <laughs> you're right, debating right. another choice, whether it's selling real estate or this. I thought of interior interior design at one point, you know, because I'm good at moving stuff around and placing uh, a bunch of things, you know, but I never got to the point where I ran out of money. I'd always get another job. I, I usually would bat like one for three uh, in auditions. And that's pretty good, that's 300 average. So uh, I never really ran out of unemployment before I got my next gig which is very lucky, very, very fortunate. So I didn't have a lot of downtime to think of my depressed state if I, if I couldn't be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's, that, that's incredible. Uh, so what's, you know, so obviously um, Night of the Living Dead 2, we've, 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 this, this is on the docket now, right? Um, yes. 
what else is what else is coming terry where where will people see you next give us some of your upcoming projects uh i also did a, a during the pandemic we shot um via this format a movie called dark offerings oh yes and it's all via these characters again my man marcus slayby and wrote it up and his lady liz uh, liz piper she, they wrote this script and they got me and some other people of course we weren't doing anything it was a pandemic we were all sitting around we got some wonderful actors together and that is supposed to be premiered this saturday at FearCon, arizona so uh, looking forward to because I, I I saw it. It's wonderful. It's really quite special. You you're really gonna enjoy this movie. You Can you give us a taste of the movie with like just sort of a uh, a gist here? Uh, yes, uh, it's the new computer age kind of monsters that are being developed now to, because we have created a life form. It's called a computer. It is electromagnetic as we are electro magnetic creatures and when it gains what we call you know sentience we see in sci-fi movies about that they will create beings that are negative okay and positive and this happens in the computer world that marcus has created he created a negative entity that and these six people you have to take six people to and the creature will you know, the creature will kill six people and if you if you don't stop it it goes on and on and on and on through your friends through your facebook friends through your that kind of thing it's uh, it's quite scary actually and it's quite well done i have to give it to him he pulled it up very nicely so it's good script uh um, is and it, so is it fx is there a lot of fx in it or is it more uh, character driven yeah. It's character driven. He's written some wonderful characters. They're old high school buddies who used to hang out and they are all now hanging out on Zoom or computer and they're all having, you know, getting into each other's heads. And all of a sudden there's this negative entity that gets into their heads. It's really cool. It's really cool. Amazing. I'm going to be looking out for that one. I'll be looking out for that one. Good. Good. So, you know, this <laughs> brings me to my final question. And I always ask this of, of uh, you know, any actor, director, you know, writer that, uh, that I'm, I'm, um, that I'm talking with, because Terry, you carry valuable insight into the craft and Day of the Dead specifically, you know, movies, those, these movies are timeless. We've said that they're, they're going to be still gaining followers long after we're gone. So somewhere out there there's young horror fans that are watching these things and they're enjoying them and they want to start on the same path as you they want to take those steps into the acting community or the writing community what's your advice specifically your advice to another young terry alexander out there who's looking to take those steps into the into the acting community well, I think you've taken the right choice, young man, because horror movies are the way many, many, many actors, great worth, have taken their first steps into the film world because they're not looking for a bankable star. See? They're not looking for somebody to sell in that way. They're selling horror. And if you can do a great job in that genre, and it's easier to get there because it's not the star genre. You, it's the right direction to go. Just go and stay. You can create a monster. If you want to play an evil person, you can do that. If you want to play a sympathetic person, you can do that. There's a lot of different characters in horror, but the avenues are just a little more open as starting out in horror. So I would suggest it's a good path to take, man, you know, as opposed to romantic stuff that Meryl Streep is going to get or somebody like that. You know, you know what I'm saying. It's, uh, I know what you're saying. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. you know, Terry, I'm going to, I'm going to end this interview by borrowing one of your own lines, if I may. All right. And, uh, when you said that uh, what we're doing is a waste of time, and time is all we have. You know, 
I would like to say this has been a wonderful uh, amount of time spent for me. I am so happy to have had this opportunity to to meet you and interact with you. Um, I'm going to take two seconds to be a big fanboy and say, love you, love your performance. And thanks for being on Ice Creams, Terry. I really appreciate it. Hey, hey, love you, We the North. And I hope to get up there and see you soon, my friend. I really do. It would be a pleasure to talk to you again, really. Terry Alexander. Thank sir. you for joining us, sir. Oh, my pleasure, truly.